Hello everyone, thanks for joining us. I'm Karuna and I'm here with Delson Armstrong. We're at Damasuka Meditation Center and this should be an interesting conversation. We want to really get into some of the Buddhist cosmology. So Delson, I'll start by asking you, what is samsara? Can you unpack it a little bit for us? Sure. Uh, samsara is really conditioned reality, conditioned experience. Uh, if you want to put it in a nutshell, it's really the, the working of karma. When we talk about karma, karma is uh, understood in a different ways depending upon how you want to see it. There's unwholesome karma, there's wholesome karma, and there is the karma that is neither wholesome nor unwholesome. And that's the karma through the process of using the Eightfold Path. There is old karma and new karma and, and all these different understandings. But it is karma that continues to spin the wheel of samsara. When we talk about the wheel of samsara, the idea is that there is rebirth that happens. Now, rebirth is not the same as reincarnation. So we have to understand reincarnation means there's an incarnate soul that continues to take re uh, uh, different lives. So it's one thread of a soul or one thread of consciousness that comes from one lifetime to the next lifetime and so on. But rebirth is different. What rebirth says is there's no self, there's no soul. It's just karma that causes the arising of new consciousness to arise in a new existence. And then that then gives rise to certain karma depending upon your intentions, the choices, the actions, and everything else related to that. And then if there's a further rebirth, that arises because that consciousness then dissipates and that karma, that new karma gives rise to another consciousness that then gives rise to another lifetime. And you're talking about on a, on a micro level now because we're not talking about a consciousness as like a soul. <clears throat> no, I'm talking about the micro level as well as the macro level. As well level. as the macro, yeah. What I'm saying here is, on the micro level, especially in the in the sixth jhana, in the in the arupa jhana of infinite consciousness, you see the arising and uh, basically flickering or things like that. And what you're seeing is the arising and passing away of individual consciousnesses. But those individual consciousnesses are not in of themselves self. They are just arising because of causes and conditions. Now you can expand this up into your daily life, but you can then expand this up into an entire lifetime and then between one lifetime and the next lifetime. And this is really that whole process of samsara. And samsara constitutes of various planes of existence. There are the 31 planes of existence as we know them. Yeah, so let's, and so the point I was just emphasizing is that there's not, unlike this, the idea of reincarnation being a soul and then it reincarnates, it's a bunch of consciousnesses arising and passing away, including into the next lifetime. That's correct. And, and so, yeah, let's get into those different 31 planes of existence, <laughs> uh, places you can end up depending on your karma. That's right. That's right. So I think it would be ideal if we start with this realm that we're in right now, which is the human existence. And the human existence is quite interesting because this is an opportunity for you, a really rare opportunity for you to get off of the wheel of samsara, a very rare opportunity for you to experience Nibbana. So the Buddha actually has a certain uh, interesting metaphor that he uses or a simile that he uses where, uh, if I remember correctly, it's basically imagine uh, there's a tortoise or a turtle uh, and every hundred, every hundred years or so, it uh, peeks out of its shell. And there is like a, a ring or some kind of a net. And the chance of that net uh, latching onto the head of that turtle when it peeks out uh, is the rarity. That's the, that's the, that's the equivalent of how rare of a chance of human life is possible, a human existence is possible. Once you really understand that, then you take things in a different way. Then you realize that, okay, this is an opportunity not to be wasted. This is an opportunity, this lifetime here in the human existence is an opportunity to really work towards uh, awakening, 
and work towards getting off of the wheel of samsara. And the reason the human realm is the way it is, is because there's just enough, let's say, suffering to get a person to get to that point of samvega. Samvega is the urgency of seeing that, okay, I'm tired of suffering now. Is there a way out? And it allows the mind then to seek, and then it usually will seek the Dhamma, and then from there experience the Dhamma and experience Nibbana and so on. But there's also just enough pleasure in the form of the sensual pleasures as well as mental pleasures. So you could say that human existence is sort of the best of both worlds, if you want to put it that way, because you have some certain pleasures uh, which are also the experience of jhana, for example. Uh, but then you also have certain pain. Uh, so your nervous system in this particular existence, in the human existence, is wired for both certain levels of pleasure and for certain levels of pain. And so that pain motivates somebody to find greater pleasure, but eventually they see with insight and with correct understanding that this pleasure also is impermanent. So the sensual pleasures become less and less likely to grasp on, uh, to be grasped on when you experience the jhanas, because you see there is a pleasure born uh, not from the senses, not from sensual pleasures, but born in the mind, in the experience of the mental realm. So that helps you to really understand the impermanent nature of this conditioned reality, and that gets you off of the wheel when you have enough insight into the links of dependent origination. Below the human realm, there is the, the the, the other realms, which are the hell realms, the ghost realms, the hungry ghost realms, and the animal realms. Now, the thing is, these lower realms, are, the existence into these lower realms happen because of specifically wrong view. So it's understood that when you become a stream enterer, when you become a sotapanna, you close off any possibility of rebirth in any of these lower existences. And that is a wonderful thing to think about. I mean, that is a great motivator to understand, which is, if I can do this practice correctly, if I do the twin practice and am successful, and success meaning attain sotapanna, attain stream entry, then I have dropped a mountain of suffering. I have dropped an ocean of suffering. Because now I will, well, the mind or the experience will be that there will be no more rebirth in a lower realm. And that's a wonderful thing to consider. One of the key reasons for existences in lower realms is to do with wrong view. So the whole experience of following this path, following the tw uh, twin practice, doing the six R's, is about getting to the right view. And the right view is the understanding of the Four Noble Truths to a certain extent. The right view is the understanding of karma. And karma is basically action and consequence. If I do something, I will feel the consequence of that at a future period of time, whether it's in one moment or a lifetime later, or multiple lifetimes later, depending upon the seed of that karma and how quickly it grows and other things like that. But if you are if you are able to follow this path, then you get to the right view. And because of that right view, you have dropped all other wrong views that can lead you to confusion, not only in this world, not only in this lifetime, but confusion in future lifetimes. And those future lifetimes will be lifetimes of misery and confusion in the lower realms. Okay, and maybe we could get into what those realms actually uh, look like? What are the beings like? What are the yeah. nervous systems like? Yeah, that's interesting because the hell realms are like your own personal hell, if you will. So depending upon what you did, the severity of your actions and so on, you or that karma creates your own hell. <clears throat> now, the, the understanding is when the being, uh, well, first of all, it's important to understand the being spontaneously generates and what that means is there's no birthing process. There's no birthing process as we understand through the process of mammals and, and human beings, or there's no process of being in an egg and then hatching out of an egg and those kinds of 
uh, ways of coming into existence. This is spontaneous generation. And what that means is the karma produces the nama rupa, produces the mentality materiality in which the new consciousness becomes active. And so whatever the karma is will then generate what that new body will be in the hell realm. So once that happens, the, the understanding is this person or this being now is led into a hallway or some kind of a ca cave or cavern or however you visualize it. And they are met with what is, uh, what is a being named as Yama. So these are the wardens of hell who guide you through to meet Yama. And Yama is uh, sort of like a, like a concierge of hell, if you will. He's the guy who says, okay, welcome. Now you, you know, these are the deeds, you know, have you reviewed these deeds? Do you know what you've done? And so on. And continue on. So he's not here to judge you. He's, he's just there to remind you, did you see this happen? Were you not aware of the impermanence of life? Were you not aware of the suffering in life? Were you not aware of karma that if you did bad things, that you would be punished for them, even in that same lifetime. Let's say you robbed a bank and you got caught. You robbed the bank, that was the bad action. You got caught, arrested, and went to jail. That is the consequence of that wrong action. So uh, after this reminder, after this review phase, then the being is led into their personal hell. So Yama is not there to cast judgment. And he arises in that life uh, or in that existence of hell. And it's important to understand he's, he's both a peta and a deva. In other words, he has certain qualities which allow him to experience the deva realms, but then he comes back to his office work of being this concierge of hell, if you will. And one of the reasons is because in a previous life, he might have been a judge who judged too harshly. He might have been a judge who became self-righteous. He might have been a judge who was misguided and judged wrongly, and so on. And so the lesson for him to learn there is everybody is guided by their own karma. Mm -hmm. Their punishment is guided by their karma. It's not that you as a self are one, the one inflicting on it. So he took his job too seriously, and he enjoyed it too much. And as a consequence, he is ending up as Yama in this particular hell realm. Dustin, sorry to interrupt, but before we go further into hell, uh, <laughs> I just want to, I think it's important to maybe note where is this understanding coming from? Where do all these details come from? Yes, this comes from the suttas. So all of the uh, planes of existence are detailed in the suttas. And this particular explanation that I'm giving you about this process of meeting Yama and everything is actually in the Majjhima Nikaya. Mm -hmm. It's in what is known as uh, the Deva Dutta Sutta, which is known as the messenger of the God Sutta. Mm. Okay, please yeah. continue. So we're, we're in hell. <laughs> <laughs> so now we've we gone, continue. We've gone, gone past Yama. Yeah, so now we go past Yama. And uh, the, the, the wardens of hell, the, the, the people who are inflicting the punishment of hell, let's say, these are people who, who were uh, torturers in a past life people who, inf who enjoyed inflicting punishment on others, people who enjoyed uh, torturing other living beings and things like that. And they, their karma leads them into this process of torturing these beings. So it's not a, it's not a nice job, obviously, and it's not, a, it's not a nice punishment, obviously, but there's no capacity for them to do anything else but run out that karma of being a warden of hell. And there might be an opportunity then to go into a, a higher existence. So that's the second type of being. And then the third type of being are, is that being that is experiencing the punishments of hell. So that's the being who was led into the office of Yama and then taken to his, his or her, let's say, personal hell, so to speak. And these personal hells, I mean, there are descriptions of it where, you know, you're you put into a vat of boiling oil and your skin is basically becoming like fried up and then you come back up again and you are regenerated and it happens again. Or, uh, or there are beings who flail you and uh, there are other beings that uh, put acid down your throat. And it's all kinds of really torturous stuff, very gratuitous tortures that can be seen.
And did you have to do something equivalent or cause that equivalent amount of pain to others to be put in those horrible situations? Yeah, so it depends upon the, the, the karma and the severity of that karma. For example, and by the way, there's hot hells, meaning there's fiery hells, and there are cold hells, which are icy cold. So it's not just like the Christian imagery of like fire and brimstone, although that's there, but there's also icy hells, which there's, it's like, uh, there's one hell which is known as the chattering of teeth because it's so cold and so on and so forth. But uh, for example, now when you come to karma, the lowest hell or the, 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 the most extreme form of hell is known as Avicii. And that is where uh, beings like Devadatta, who was the Buddha's cousin, are. Now, it's interesting to note, the reason why Devadatta was in that hell was, number one, he tried to harm the Buddha. He, he, he drew blood of the Buddha, meaning he tried to draw the blood of the Buddha with intent to harm a Buddha. And because of that, that caused him to go here. Now, the interesting thing about that is, he took refuge in the Buddha, or he, he had some level of good karma, that allows him now later on to become a Pacheka Buddha in a, in a future lifetime. So that's also important to understand that this hell, these hell realms are not permanent. What is a Pacheka Buddha for people? Who so Pacheka Buddha is a solitary Buddha. Yeah. It's one who becomes enlightened, but it doesn't have the capacity to teach the way a Sama Sama Buddha, which is the Gautam Buddha, as we know, uh, historically speaking, who mm. became a Buddha, but then had the capacity and the faculties to be able to teach the Dhamma. So Avicii hell, for example, uh, there's, there's five heinous crimes that can lead you to Avicii hell immediately. And that is uh, patricide, which is the killing of your father, the killing of your mother, matricide, uh, killing of an arahat, drawing the blood of a Buddha, and creating division in the Sangha. These are the five hyenas crimes that can lead you to the Avicii hell. And they're known as the karma that is immediate. In other words, there's no gap between when you did that karma and then you die, and then that karma immediately leads you to that hell. It's not like it will take some time to sprout and create that experience for you it will immediately lead you to that hell realm. What would be an example of creating a fissure in the Sangha? Well, uh, creating a fissure in the Sangha would mean something like uh, casting doubts on the practice, casting doubts on another member of the Sangha, or gossiping about another member of Sangha, and creating friction between the Sangha members that can cause them to fight amongst themselves, mm. and uh, creating all kinds of arguments and debates that don't lead to anywhere and that can cause even some people to leave the Sangha or start to become boisterous and, and even violent and things like that. So in creating controversies of heresy and things like that within the Sangha where people start to disagree on different things and it's just a breaking up of the Sangha and that is a terrible thing. And what makes this the worst hell, the Avicii? Well, for one, it is where there is immense amounts of different kinds of torture, and, and it really depends upon uh, the person and the actions that, it, that they do. There's a different kind of torture where they go from one end to the other, and the walls close down on them, and there's like spiked walls. So the, the different details of the punishments get really gratuitous. I mean, there's a lot of violent and very gory things that can happen to that person. And there's a mental component there, too. So we were talking about the nervous system of a human is, is able to experience both pain and pleasure. Here in this hell realms, or in these hell realms, the nervous system is built to experience the worst forms of pain and no pleasure at all. And you're there for, for how long is it on average? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it depends upon the severity of the karma. It can last for... Uh, eons, or it can last for yeah, it can last for a long, long, long time. And your is that time passing the same way time passes on Earth? You're like it aware is, of being there for eons. Yeah, it is. It is a human reckoning. But it's interesting to note that time feels slower in a hell realm. Oh jeez. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, so 
Uh, so that's hell. Do you, you want to escape hell and go, go wanna, up? Yeah, well, <laughs> is there anything further you want to say about hell? <laughs> yeah, if you want to not go to hell, uh, think about your actions. Think about what you're doing. Think about your intentions. Think about uh, what you're doing in terms of contributing to yourself and your improvement of your mind, uh, your mind and, and your emotions, which then can also reflect on how you treat other people in your relationships um, and reflects how you see the world around you, which also gets back into right view. So being able to come to that point where you can come to the right view, you completely close off any opportunity to get to uh, a hell realm. Okay. Yeah, now let's go to maybe more pleasant topics, <laughs> uh, working our way up from human, or I guess we should touch on it and hungry ghost. Yeah, so, so the hungry ghost, for example, they are, they can be seen around us if you have the ability to see them and, and they walk around and they're basically these beings that are, that were greedy in a past life or uh, unscrupulous and, and they were sort of, well, they were sort of like, uh, trying to cheat other people or or got into different different kinds of business dealings that led to cheating other people out of their savings and, and things like that. So so jealousy is one thing that leads them there. Greed is something that leads them there. Um, uh, deceit is something else that leads them there. And And what happens is the greed for something causes them to always be looking for things. They're always never satisfied. You know, you, they're, they're basically sometimes described or they're seen as these beings with like large uh, bellies, right? But with very thin uh, throats. Mm. So it's like, you know, nothing can go really in to satisfy that mm. being. And they're interesting, you know, they, they have long black hair. They look like ghosts. Or you would see in, in like, uh, you know, like that movie, The Grudge, if anyone has seen it. Uh, you know, there's like those kinds of beings. They look very much like very emaciated, uh, very thin, um, deprived. You know, they're not happy beings at all. I thought it was a tiny mouth. Is that one? Well, there's one that has a tiny mouth. There's one that, I mean, there's different looking ones. There's one that has like a tiny gullet or a tiny mm -hmm. throat. There's another one that has like a mouth the size of like a pinhole. Mm. Uh, there's one that has like a, their neck, uh, well, their neck is like this and their head cranes up like this. So for them to be able to look down, they have to bend over like this. So there's all kinds of weird looking, very macabre looking beings in the hungry ghost realms. But the, the theme of the hungry ghost or the understanding of existence in the hungry ghost is you can't maintain, you can't create any good karma here, just like in the hell realms. You're only... Uh, burning the fuel of the karma that has led you to this particular realm. But when you, or when the relatives of these hungry ghosts on the earth realm, uh, in, in the human existence, when they go to give something to the Sangha and they get married of that, they transfer that merit to a relative and that relative might be in a hungry ghost realm. And that merit allows them then to have a better existence in a human existence, for example. So, for example, you know, I was in Cambodia for some time and it's actually still going on. There's a festival called uh, Chumban. And what that is, is they go out to the different monasteries uh, and they donate uh, food, they donate uh, clothing, robes, uh, they donate medicines, or even some people construct new monasteries and things like that. And the merit of doing those kinds of things to support the Sangha immediately uh, they transfer that to go to uh, one of their relatives, uh, whoever that relative might be. And if that relative is a, in a hungry ghost realm, uh, that relative receives that merit. And that merit is that good karma that leads them to a human existence. Hmm. Okay, so that's hungry ghosts. And then how about animal realm? What would you say about that? So the animal realm is basically concordant with the human realm in the, in the sense that you can see animals mm -hmm. with your naked eye. You can't see hungry ghosts, you can't see other kinds of realms because you need a certain level of meditative attainment to develop your psychic vision, so to speak. 
but here the animals are perceivable and there are different kinds of animals. There's mammals and reptiles and fish and birds and so on and so forth. And uh, the animal realm is also painful. It's a painful existence. You think about animals when they're out in the wilderness. You know, they, they are, first of all, they are known as the tirachana yoni, which means uh, parallel, or in other words, they're on all fours. And uh, when they're in the wilderness, they have to survive. They have to look for food. They have to look for water. They have to look for shelter against the elements, against the rain and snow and whatever it might be. And, uh, you know, there's always like predators around or uh, there's not enough food around and things like that. Now, granted, there are some animals like the animals of Damasuka that have really good karma to be animals here. You know, you have really great cats and dogs who are well-fed and loved and nourished and all of that. So there is some mixed karma there in which uh, those kinds of animals being pets of uh, generous uh, you know, family members who like to feed them and love them and take care of them, uh, that's a good thing. And, and, and sometimes uh, the animal might be born in a or might be part of a family where that family is following the Dhamma or somebody in that family is following the Dhamma and they might go to Dhamma talks or watch Dhamma talks and the animal is listening to those things and that those formations of those Dhamma talks can lead them to having good merit and that can actually lead them to having uh, a good existence in a human life. Now there's an interesting side story. The idea is that when the Bodhisattva, before he became the Buddha, he left his palace on a horse and the name of the horse was Kantak. And because of the service he rendered to the Bodhisattva, when Kantak uh, died, he went into Tusita heaven. Mm. And now he's born as a being in the Tusita heaven, which we'll get to uh, soon. But that is really the, the animal existence. It is an existence of pain, but it also has mixed karma depending upon uh, the previous karma that led them there. And when people become attached to their animals, become attached to their pets, they think of them before they die, they're, they're liable to experience that existence. Mm. Uh, so if you see visions as you die of animals and things like that, then there's a fair chance you're going to get into the animal realm. Mm. Okay, so now from human we go up to the deva realms. I, yeah. I was talking about the intermediary realms, right? Like the realms just before the deva. So you were talking about, can we get into the deva realms? And I said, before we get into that, I just want to touch a little bit on the realms between the humans and the devas. Okay. Yeah, yeah so why don't you just yeah, go ahead on that? Right. So before we get into the, the other deva realms, I just want to touch a little bit on some of the other beings that are there uh, within this realm of existence. Because... They, they are the inspiration for a lot of the fairy tales that you hear about. So like the fairies or the pixies or the leprechauns and genies and all of these other things are basically all of the other kinds of beings like the kinaras and all of all really strange kinds of beings. And there's the nagas, which are like these reptilian-like beings. Uh, and they, they are the inspiration for the experience of dragons that you see all around cultures, uh, in different cultures and things like that. So people used to see these things more often, presumably. Well, they, they either somehow encountered them because they kind of stumbled into it, and then they were like, wow, look at that, I saw something. And other people didn't see it, and they were like, yeah, I don't know if you're hallucinating or something, but there was something to be said about the cultural similarities between some of these different beings, uh, even though they're worlds apart or countries apart. So these different beings exist, uh, and actually there's, a, there's an interesting story where you know, there was a Naga, who's like a reptilian being, and who's a shapeshifter, and he was, uh, well, he turned into a human, or he looked like a human, uh, and then he wanted to join the Sangha. So he went to join the Sangha, and what happened was, uh, Later on at night, he retransformed back into his Naga self, into his Naga look, and it, it just scared everybody, and they were like, what is this? And so one of the rules that came up was, you know, <laughs> when you go and ordain, one of the questions is, are you an animal uh, or a Naga pretending to be a human? <laughs> 
and you have to be honest and you have to say whether you are or you're not. I'm sure that's deterred a lot of uh, <laughs> Naga monks. <laughs> yeah. Which is interesting because Naga also means uh, Arahat. It's another way, it's another word for right. Arahat. But it has no connection to the word Naga from the reptilians. Right. Right. We see here in, in the sharing of the merit, you know, it says. Uh, Devas and Nagas of mighty power. Right. It says Devas and Nagas of mighty power. And what you see, what devas of obviously the celestial beings, but nagas here is referring to existing arahats, ex arahats here in samsara at the moment. Right. And the reason why they're called naga is not because they're reptilian in nature or anything like that, but it's a short form of two words. It's like a contraction of two words. That's the na, which means no, and aguna. So aguna means, and that's really interesting, it's like a double negative. So guna means something that is bad. And aguna is uh, something that is uh, not bad. So it's like not aguna, so not bad, bad. It's like it is good. It's the best. Not bad, bad. <laughs> right. Or not that bad? No, not, not. So so I'll go back to that. So the experience is, it's na, which is no, not. and then aguna. Aguna. Yeah, which means bad means bad. So they're not bad. Okay. <laughs> the, not ar bad. the arahats are not so bad. They're not, not yeah, bad. Yeah, they're okay. You know, they're pretty good. <laughs> so so that's, that's the contraction. The naga means yeah. they're not bad. Uh, meaning they, they are, they're completely wholesome. There's not one iota of an unwholesome mm -hmm. nature in the, in the arahat. So these are the different kinds of beings and, you know, different kinds of uh, things that people can encounter, different kinds of humanoids and, and things like that because that's the other understanding is there are other humanoids that are existing that are not exactly the same kind of species as humans they're just a different type of human can we perceive those or like what would be an example of one of those well one understanding is like in the in the past homo sapiens and neanderthals oh, might yeah. have lived together for example yeah. uh things like that uh, now, when we get into the higher realms, now we're talking about the six sensual heavens. And they get better as you ascend into uh, each of the realms. But uh, these realms are basically called the Deva Lokas. So I'm just going to talk about them collectively with a few details here and there, because it's, it's quite a lot of information. But basically, the way to get into any kind of Deva Loka is you have virtue. So in other words, if you have wholesome mindset, you have a wholesome intention, you get into these Deva realms. Now, before you go into the Deva realms, there's also a realm known as the realm of the Asuras. So they're like, they're Deva-like beings, but they're not exactly Devas. So depending upon your map of the realms of existence, they're sometimes below the humans and sometimes just above the humans. But they have a pretty good life. I mean, they, they live in a way where they, they party all night long and, and things like that. And, you know, they're very strong. They're, they're what you would call titans mm. in Greek mythology. Oh, really? So Asuras are basically these very fierce, strong beings who look like, you know, when you see some Asian uh, drawings and things like that, or you see a Tibetan uh, drawing of like the wheel of samsara, you'll see like this demonic looking being and yeah. that's like an asura. That's what they look like in some oh, ways. Really? Like they look like a fierce lion or like a fierce dragon head or things like that. So they're very, very, uh, well, they are scary looking, but at the same time they have mixed karma because they have a pretty comfortable lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that they have a rivalry between the deva, between themselves and the devas of the Tawatimsa heavens. And the Tavatimsa heaven is the heaven of the 33 gods, specifically. And the idea is, well, the understanding is that they used to be there. And uh, Saka, who is also known as Indra in Sanskrit, he led an army and he tricked them by getting them drunk. And they fell. And so Asura also means like those who fell mm -hmm. and those who got drunk and fell. So, so they... They got tricked, and ever since then, they've been trying to get back to Tavatimsa heaven. And so the understanding is, anytime there's more unwholesomeness in existence, the Asuras kind of get further and further ahead towards Tavatimsa heaven. But not just quite, because there's always some wholesome nature there. 
So there's al they're always at battle. And here's an interesting thing. The chief of the Asuras is uh, Vepachiti. And he uh, has a big rivalry against Saka, or Indra, who is the king of the 33. But Saka is married to Vepachiti's daughter. So they're connected as uh, father-in-law or son-in-law. <laughs> wow. Okay. So, and you mentioned Greek mythology briefly. The Titans could, that's what they may have been referring to. Yeah. And can, I think if I recall, the Titans gave birth to what became some of the like Zeus and some of the mainstream gods. Right. And then Zeus, uh, what he did was he overthrew them on Mount Olympus. Right. And then he established that particular deity of realm, which is Poseidon and Zeus and Ares and all of the other different kinds of gods. So that, that comes from that idea. So they're in the Asura realm? Yes. All of those? And they can give birth to other beings or no? Well, that's interesting because some, some deva, uh, devas can give birth to other devas, but just by thinking about them, manifesting them. So okay. in these realms now, when we get into the uh, experience of the Asuras and Deva realms, and from here on out, there is what is known as spontaneous generation, as we talked about. So the karma of the previous existence creates the body and the consciousness descends into that body. And so it's just manifests just like that. And how come, for example, the Greeks were really interested in Zeus and his posse, <laughs> but, then, but you don't hear other cultures talking about them, for example. Well, if you think about Zeus and so on, there, is, uh, there are cultural, cultural correlates of them in the form of the Norse gods. Okay. You have Odin and Thor, uh, Loki, and, and beings like that. So, and in the Hindu or the Indian pantheon that we know of, of Indra, and Agni and Varuna and all of those gods are correlates to the Greek mythologies. Mm. Or even the Roman mythology, which obviously adapted it from the Greek mythology. Okay, and these are probably because people may have perceived... They perceived it in whatever they, way they did and they interpreted it in a certain way. So okay. there, there have been people who can see into these different realms and then they interpreted it according to what they saw in their cultural context. Right. But there's always a similarity if you think about it, because Indra is also known as the, the lightning or thunder-wielding god, mm -hmm. just like Zeus is, or just like Thor is. So that might be the same post or the same... Yeah, and that's a good point you bring up, because the post of Saka, Saka is not just a being that comes into existence and goes away, it's a post in that particular realm. So once this current Saka goes on, there will be a new being to replace him as the mm. um, I guess another point before we go on from there is that uh, I've seen this giant mountain that exists in, the, in Buddhist cosmology. Could you explain what that is? Yeah, that is known as uh, Sumeru. That's uh, Sumeru in Sanskrit or Sineru in Pali. And the idea is this is like the axis mundi. It's like uh, it's the center of the earth. And it's, it's a spiritual place. So in other words, it is a cosmic force that extends beyond the earth. And it, you can see it from many yojanas. And that's like many, many thousands of miles into, into yeah. space. But physically speaking, you cannot see it. Okay, because someone was speculating that might have been Mount Meru they were referring to or something Right. Like that. that is the Mount Meru. Sumeru? That's yeah. Mount Meru. But, but you're saying it's not the physical Mount Meru that's there. Right, so people just took that and said that that's Mount Meru in the physical realm. Or in right. the same way, you have Olympus and there is a physical correlate to that and to say that's where the gods were living. So, right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah, you want to just summarize where we are right now on the realms? Right, so we talked about the Tabatims of Heaven. Now, I just want to just kind of jump ahead. So now we're going to talk about a little, some more important highlights of that, which is the Tusita Heaven. Mm -hmm. And the Tusita Heaven is where the present Bodhisattva is there. Mm -hmm. And that is the Maitreya uh, Bodhisattva. And when this, the Dhamma as we know it, 
becomes corrupted and eventually fades away, then this particular bodhisattva will then uh, choose to take existence in a human realm and will choose his parents and choose everything like that and take birth and become a bodhisattva on earth. And then he will go through that same journey that Gautama went through and then attain enlightenment or attain awakening and then become a full, fully awakened Buddha and continue teaching the Dhamma. So the understanding here is there have been other Buddhas in the past. There have been innumerable Buddhas in the past. In this particular eon, we have had uh, four Buddhas, and the fifth is uh, the one to come, which is the Maitreya Buddha. Any speculation on how far in the future that might be? Not for some time, because there's a lot of things that have to happen for, that to ha for the Dhamma to be corrupted. The idea is that you know, it would last for a certain amount of time, and there will be certain signs about that. So this gets into the acestology of it, which is like uh, you know, the, the aging of humans, or the lifespan of humans, let's say, uh, diminishes and deteriorates to just 10 years old. Whoa, that's uh, that's quite drastic. That means something's gone really wrong. Yeah, yeah. So that the means being run by ten-year-olds, we're in trouble. It's a it's a big problem. And then and then what happens is eventually, and the reason why that happens is because there's a lot more unwholesomeness coming into play. There's more corrupt uh, corruption going on amongst people. There's a lot more violence going on amongst people. There's a lot more stealing and lying. Uh, you know, rapes and, and things like that. And, and then eventually it becomes so bad that humans get into this post-apocalyptic kind of state. Mm. You know, the kind of thing we see in Mad Max and, and things like that. And then eventually it starts up again and people realize the, the, the severity of the situation and they start to again take the precepts and they start to become wholesome again. And at a certain point then when the time is ripe, the Bodhisattva chooses to descend into the human plane as the Bodhisattva on the earth and then starts his journey of rediscovering the Dhamma. Hmm. Okay, so he's hanging out in Tusita heaven. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, there's other kinds of devas. Uh, there's the cloud kind of devas, the rain devas, and things like that. But there's one interesting deva I want to talk about. And it's, it might sound surprising, but that's the de he's, his name is Mara. Or his or her name is Mara, depending on how you want to see it. But Mara is actually a deva. Mara has been, in popular culture, been uh, looked on as a devil figure, like a satanic figure, sort of like one who tempts the Buddha and things like that. But he lives up there in one of the, high, the highest uh, heavens, and he's just chilling out there, and he has his own sort of posse. He's sort of a rebel figure there, and he has his own group of groupies who just hang out with him and things like that. And his whole thing is, the way I liken it to is like, if you've ever seen crabs uh, in, in, a, in a pot of water, like a deep pot of water, and they're trying to get out of the, the pot, there's another crab that's like grabbing onto them and they're like, if I can't, yeah. if I can't get out, I'm not going to let you get out either. Yeah, the crab's in a bucket. Today. Crab's in a bucket, there you yeah. go. So, so Mara has that kind of a mindset. His whole thing is, you know, this is amazing. I mean, we are here enjoying all of our sensual pleasures. Why do you want to leave that? Why do you want to leave that kind of a state of being? So his whole thing is whenever he goes to a monk or whenever he goes to a meditator or whenever he... He, he goes to an arahant or a Buddha, he'll try to say, you know, he'll try to misdirect them, mislead them into some other situation. And Mara is also a psychological force, if you will. So there's different ways of understanding Mara, but Mara is definitely a being who contributes to trying to make people stop on their path, trying, people to, uh, trying to make people give up uh, trying to meditate, give up. Uh, trying to go into a jhana realm because as soon as they get into a jhana realm now they experience better pleasures than sensual pleasures and then they start to get motivated to get off the wheel of samsara and so on so this is being understood literally like it's not a metaphor for the hindrances mara is actually like able to kind of hone in on meditators that are doing well and say, and says i don't want them getting off of yeah. samsara yeah 
And he's not doing it for any kind of ill will. He's just like, the more the merrier. I mean, why do you want to get off of this wheel of samsara? It's amazing. At least that's how he's looking at it. <laughs> so he's just like a crazy party deva who just like, like come on guys, keep the party going. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly it. <laughs> and so in the last two deva realms, they're known as the devas who wield certain kind of power. Mm-hmm. They, uh, and they are able to uh, experience the creation of them, their, their own and then there are devas who experience the creation of others. And really what that means is there are devas who serve other devas and there are devas who kind of are masters of other devas. But there's no, there's no, okay, so what you have to understand is the deva realms is quite boisterous and noisy with like they're partying most of the time. They're just enjoying themselves. There are some devas who have been introduced to the Dhamma and, you know, try to continue to maintain their virtue and so on. But a deva, uh, their nervous system has been primed to be able to experience the greatest amounts of pleasure. So for them, it's like, you know, just party all night long and enjoy yourself and, you know, and become heedless and become reckless. But there are some devas who realize that, no, this, this is... This is not the way to go, you know, and, and they do have some understanding of the Dhamma and try to maintain some kind of decorum. Mm. But the thing about the Devaravams is it's so long that some of them feel like they're immortal, like there's no, there's no death after this. And so they forget that whole process of impermanence and, and they get carried away with themselves. So this is really the, the Devaravams and these are the six sensual heavens. Now beyond that are the Brahma Lokas. And each of the Brahma Lokas are tied to each of the four jhanas. So there's four of them. There's four Brahma Lokas. And they're kind of graded according to the level of mastery that somebody experiences uh, when they get into a jhana realm uh, or a jhana state. So the first Brahma realm is associated with the first jhana. And in this particular realm, you have three classes of beings. You have those who are known as like the citizens of Brahma. They're sort of the people who are just walking around and doing their own thing. Uh, Then there are what are known as the Purohitas, the people who uh, are sort of the ministers of the Mahabrahma. And then there's the Mahabrahma. And the problem with being a Mahabrahma is you have this notion that you are a creator god. So what happens is after a certain point of destruction, when the when the uh, the Brahma realm is created, this first Brahma realm is created. This this the karma creates an uh, a nama rupa of that particular Brahma Maha Brahma, and he, and they come into being and they're like, wow, where am I? You know, and and they think they're the first of of existence. And then they think about another being or are there other beings around? And then suddenly other beings come up and, and he thinks or that being thinks that, oh, I created these beings. And so the idea of a creator God, when you see in other cultures, really comes from this idea of Brahma. And uh, there is a story where the Brahma feels like this and the Buddha actually goes up to the Brahma realm and uh, educates him on the fact that this is not the case. So the Abrahamic religions... Yes. Uh, now, are those all the, the same Brahma? Or is, for example, um, Allah different from Christian God? Well, if you think about it, I mean, you think about the, 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 the God or Creator in Abrahamic. It's interesting, it's Abrahamic. It's so similar to the word Brahma as well, that mm. Abraham, you know, it's uh-huh. almost like a, um, it's like a, just a, wielding of different letters and creating that word. But so that's just a side point. But if you think about the notion of those creator gods within those religions, that God is always with this idea that I am the creator of the universe and I am the uh, you know all-powerful, all-knowing, omniscient and omnipotent and all of these things. And this is exactly how Bra- Mahabrahma feels. It's like, I am all of these things. And the way to understand the Brahma beings is they are just very, very different looking to what you would think in the sensual realm. So this is important to understand. Everything from the hell realms all the way up to the six, sensual, the six sensuous heavens, this is all what's part of the sensual realm. 
It's also known as the sense sphere. So it's because that's where you experience everything through the five physical senses and so on. But here, when it comes to the Brahmas, they are so different in the way that they experience reality. It's, it's understood in the suttas that the Brahmas hold the galaxies in the palm of their hands and they look at them like marbles. So you can imagine the, the grandiosity that they have in terms of their being. And their nervous system, so to speak, is wired to experience the first jhana, these particular Brahmas. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they're always blissed out. They enjoy the factors of the first jhana, which is the joy or the pithi and the sukha. And they have mental activity going on in the way of verbalizing and, and things like that. Do they have a nervous system per se? Or? Yeah, they have a nervous system in the sense that they are still in the form realm. So there is some kind of luminous realm that's going on. So when we think about like the nervous system, we're, now we're going into the realm of the subtle nervous system. The things like the nadis that you know of in yoga or other Eastern traditions where the chi flows and things like that. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of experience that they have. But that is wired to experience great amounts of joy, great amounts of elation. Okay. And then uh, where do the yogic or the rather the Hindu gods fit in, like Shiva and I guess Brahma is one of them and yeah. the third. Uh, Vishnu. Vishnu. Yeah. So it's interesting to see that in the old religion, the old Vedic religion, we had Indra, we had Varuna, we had Agni, we had uh, Vayu, and we had other gods who are part of the 33 in the Tawatimsa. But eventually the culture changed and they discovered discovered other gods, which are in these other realms, in the Brahma realms. So while we have Brahma, who is also the, the Hindu god Brahma, who is part of a Brahma realm, even Shiva and Vishnu are also part of the different Brahma lokas. Okay. So, and then is Allah a separate Brahma and Christian God a separate Brahma? Or are these maybe pointing to the same? They're pointing to the same thing. The same one? Yeah. Because if you think about it, Vishnu is the creator and the, uh, within this particular ideology. Sorry, uh, Brahma is the creator in this particular ideology, in the Hindu ideology. And so it's the same kind of idea that it gave, uh, this Brahma gave uh, life to existence and created all of existence and so on. And then Vishnu is known as a preserver. Now it's interesting to note that within Hinduism, you have different sects. Mm. And so these different sects uh, always have a certain importance to a certain kind of God. So you have the Vaishnavites, who believe that Vishnu is the supreme creator. Mm. Or you have the Shaivites who believe that uh, Shiva is the ultimate. But these are all epitaphs for the same kind of being. And so is there one Brahma, since you talked about they're kind of, they've got the galaxies in their fingertips, is there one Brahma that is kind of reigning over our solar system? Uh, there's uh, multiple different Brahmas. So in other words, there's multiple Earths. Uh, just like there are multiple galaxies, there's multiple levels uh, on, on the vertical plane. You have the 31 planes of existence. Yeah. But then parallel to that, you have all of these other planes of existence that are being experienced outside of what we're experiencing here. Right. So there's a Brahma uh, for another galaxy. There's a Brahma for a different right. galaxy or a different universe and things like that. But we have one Brahma. For this earth, there's one, one yeah. Brahma in charge. And that's, exactly. That's why you're well, saying it's the same one. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, when we say in charge, really just in charge of the Brahma Loka. But, right. but we have only one Brahma with this particular vertical plane of the 31 realms of existence. So it's like a... It's like, it's a hologram, it just continues on, it's like fractals, you know, it's... How horizontal does it go? Like, any idea, of, is there a quantity or is it pretty infinite? It's pretty much beginningless, so it okay. just continues on. So it's vertically, it's just 31, but horizontally, it's infinite. You could say it's infinite, because the reason is, uh, it, it, there is a scope in terms of how far you can radiate, and there's multiple universes. And the way universes are created is through karma. The understanding is that when there's karma, it generates the building blocks of reality. Now, that doesn't mean karma is permanent or some kind of creator or something like that. It's just understood 
that the flow of karma starts to create certain circumstances, whether it's in our human existence. But there are times when the Brahma realms are completely empty, or certain realms are completely empty because there's no karma, there's no beings there to experience their karma there. Mm. I guess that kind of it's, goes to that phrase, if the a tree falls in the woods and there's no one there to hear it. <laughs> it's like if there's no beings to experience it. Is, is there anyone to know that there's there? a realm there? Yeah, yeah exactly. Mm. Exactly. So that is, the, uh, that is the first Brahma realm. The second Brahma realm is associated with the second jhana. And these are known as the Abhasara beings. And there are three classes of those as well, depending upon the level of mastery of the jhana. And when we talk about the level of mastery, that means, that means basically getting to the jhana itself is one level of mastery. A second level of mastery is able to get uh, into that jhana quite frequently. And then the third level of mastery is being able to go into that jhana at will at different time intervals and determinations and things like that. Mm. So the second Brahma realm is totally different from the first Brahma realm in that now these beings, they look completely different. Uh, first of all, there, there are three main categories of those beings, but there's a fourth just underneath that where there's still some verbalizing going on. These are beings that are sort of on the border between the first and the second. So for whatever reason, because of their karma, they still have some level of uh, verbalizations. And they're known as, basically the way it's translated is like beings of a lesser or a corrupted radiance, if you will. So the Abhasara means the beings of radiance. And the reason is because when you look at them, they look like spheres of light. Because hmm. they're so bright. The, and the reason they're so bright and radiant is because of the joy that they're feeling the joy and the comfort that they're feeling that is void of any other kind of factors of the jhana. And so this radiance continues on. And if you see an Abhasara being, just look, they just look like there's just this sphere of light around them. And so they do have a subtle nervous system that is geared to experience greater amounts of that joy, greater amounts of that sukha. Mm. And these beings, uh, they live on for quite some time, for many, many, many eons, so much more than the Brahma realms and so on, uh, the, the first Brahma realm. But are they as deluded into thinking that they are some kind of God creator? No, uh, they are more, more interested in just experiencing the bliss. Okay, they're, so they're, sort of, they're heroin addicts. They're heroin addicts. They just love that bliss and they're just burning out that bliss. So there's very little opportunity for them to really understand anything related to the Dhamma. They just think this is what it is and I'm going to just experience, uh, you know, this bliss. But they were masters of the second jhana, you said, right? That's right. So they must have found the, the Dhamma at some point. But they're no longer interested in cultivating it further. Okay. Uh, under certain circumstances, they will. But if we have time, we'll get into it. But. For the most part, these beings, the Abhasara beings, are just burning out the fuel of their karma from having attained the second jhana. And you mentioned there's three levels of mastery. Uh, at what point would you make it pretty likely to be born into that, into that uh, correlating realm? Well, when you have an attachment to that jhana, there is, uh, you are liable to experience that particular realm, that particular Brahma realm. Okay. Okay. All right. So going up from there. So then we get into the third Brahma realm, which are the Subhakina beings. And these beings are, are radiant, but they have like, you know how you see a, a gold bar and there's light reflected on the gold bar. And you see this, this really cool kind of radiance to it. That's the way their radiance is, the Subhakina. So they're, they're kind of goldish in color, and it's very warm, very vibrant, but they're very chilled out. They're, they're, they have complete sukha. So in the, the first and second Brahma realms, there's this certain level of vibrancy, which is from the joy, from the pithi. But now in the third Brahma realm, they're kind of very more chill. They're just like, 
really enjoying themselves and they have this sukkah. And so it's sort of understood that one of the ways the, the similes explain it is it's like the flame of a candle. And in, in the first and second Brahma realms, the candle flame is sort of just all over the place. You know, it's, it's just moving here and about. But in the case of the third Brahma realm, it, the candle flame is stable. It doesn't move at all because the burning out process of that sukkha takes slower. It's a slower burn of karma, if you will. Hmm. Okay, so that correlates with the third jhana. Yeah. And does this go all the way up to the eighth? Uh, yeah, we'll go. Yeah, we'll, so okay. so the fourth for the the fourth is interesting because there's different components to the fourth Brahma realm. The fourth Brahma realm it has uh, different levels of beings, but uh, they're always categorized under one thing, which are known as the Vehafala beings, which are known as the beings of great fruit. So these beings are those who have get, gotten to a level of the fourth jhana, and they take birth here. But within the fourth jhana, you have these beings who experience supreme equanimity. They are the most chilled out. It's like, everything's good, man. There's nothing to worry about. You know, it's that kind of feeling. And they're just all just very, very comfortable. Nothing to think about. Nothing to do. Just chilling out. And um, one question that comes up is, so obviously going horizontally, there's infinite numbers of these beings. But just taking our slice is there progressively less of these beings in each realm as it gets rarer mm -hmm. to do that? Yes. So let's say there's you know seven billion humans. Then are there a lot of beings in hell and way less as you go up? Or? Yeah, I, I know people will not want to hear this, but there's more beings in hell than there are on Earth. Wow. And there's obviously more animals. Yeah, yeah. There, are there are, are more animals than there are humans. I mean, collectively speaking, but there are more, majority of them are in hell. That's not a nice thing to say, but that's the truth. Wow. Okay. So we should be <laughs> thankful that we're <laughs> yeah. here. Um, and then so let's I, say, yeah, how rare does it get to... It gets pretty verified. I mean, it depends upon, like, for example, as I was getting into the fourth jhana, Within this particular realm, you're still in the form realm, but now they're getting closer to the formless realms, which means that now these beings start to become translucent. And their nervous system is sort of geared to just experience comfort and tranquility and equanimity. Now there's another class of beings in there known as the Asanyata beings. And the Asanyata beings are those beings without perception and feeling and consciousness. But that doesn't mean that somebody who entered into cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness gets into this particular realm of existence or this kind of being. It's those beings who do certain kind of practices that get them into states of suspended animation. So in India, for example, you have yogis who will, you know, bury themselves into a box. They'll like sit into the box and go into suspended animation and then People will bury them under the ground and after like some time they will uh, pick them up again and they'll just come back out. But it's, it's not a feeling of ces uh, cessation perception. It's not, a, it's not an experience of cessation, perce uh, cessation of perception, feeling and consciousness. It's just a suspended animation. So what, they, what happens is they become so concentrated in their mind that they freeze all thought. They suppress the mind completely. Someone described it as having, it's like someone, jam, there's gears turning and someone jams something in the gears. Yes. Yes, that's exactly it. And, and so when that mind stops, it's like frozen in time, if you will. Like it's just frozen. And then if a person goes into this experience of the asanyata beings, which by the way, they do have bodies. They do have form. But there are other beings within the fourth jhana, of, within the fourth Brahma loka, that are kind of taking care of them and, and you know, making sure that they're uh, being uh, okay and, and things like that. But these beings, 
they just go on f without any kind of thought, without any kind of feeling, without any kind of perception, without any kind of consciousness for eons. And then whatever thought was that arise or arose after they come up, they, they dissolve and that thought creates a karma or formations that then create a consciousness that descends on the, into the Nama Rupa that was created based on that particular thought. Which means that if in through this process of suppression, the person, the yogi or whoever, has a certain kind of thought that might be unwholesome, and it freezes, and then they go into this realm of the asanyata, and then they come back up, that particular thought, it can be liable to take them into a lower realm, take them to a hell realm or a hungry ghost realm or an animal realm. So did they, um, you were giving the example of the yogi going, going in the box, but that yogi comes back out of the box, is this, does, do they go there temporarily and then come back? No. Or these are people who, who die in that state. They will either die in that state or they'll just die of whatever it is, but because they've continuously done this, they think that that is the ultimate. And so they just die into that state. Hmm. So after they die, whatever thought was there before that will lead them into their next life after making uh, their, their whole experience of that particular existence. And then that thought will lead them into a new existence. So they, the yogi will die, but then there will be an experience in the asanyata realm. So while we are talking about the fourth jhana, there are these beings in that vicinity which have different levels, and these are known as the pure abodes. And there is a specific way to get to the pure abodes, and that's to become an anagami. So we understand a stream enterer is somebody who has destroyed the first three fetters. We understand the sakadagami is one who has weakened and loosened sensual craving and aversion. But the anagami destroys the first five fetters. And there are five different kinds of anagami that are understood in the suttas. And these are references from the Anguttara and the Samyutta Nikaya. So they're dispersed in different parts. But the understanding is there, these different five types of the anagamis, they're described in a certain way in, um, well, they're mentioned in the suttas, but they're described a certain way in the commentaries, which don't match uh, to how it is understood from the suttas. And the reason I say that is because the first type of anagami is known as the anagami who attains parinibbana in the interval so it comes from the Pali Antara Parinibai, which means one who attains Parinibbana in the interval. And the idea is just before there can be any consciousness that can arise to give rise to a next existence, if a person has become an anagami in a human existence, for, exa for example, when they pass on, there's just enough fuel for certain kind of rising of consciousness, but just not enough to create the overall, uh, overall uh, step into a new rebirth. So this particular being will fizzle out in the sense that they will experience the complete uh, destruction of the, first, uh, the, the, the second five fetters. So they will become effectively an arahant, attain arahatship, attain the fruition, and then enter into parinibbana, so to speak. So this is the first kind of anagami. But Parinibbana, probably you should just mention what that is. Parinibbana is the, is the final Nibbana. Mm. It's the experience that the Buddha had uh, as, as when he died. And we, we don't really say die because what, exp what happens is the aggregates get di dissolved. That means the, f the form, the feeling, the perception, uh, the formations and the consciousness no longer have any more fuel. And so that's the, also understood as the Nibbana without remainder. You're off the wheel. Well, you're completely off the wheel after that. Or whatever has happened has come off of the wheel, let's say. Because an Arahat is not necessarily any more being. There's no more coming into being for them. Right. So they are already off the wheel. It's just that they have the fuel of the aggregates keeping them there. And then the aggregates dissolve. And that's the final Pari Nibbana. Mm. So in the case of the first type of anagami, this is what happens. The second type of anagami is known as the anagami uh, or one upon landing. 
the one who attains parinibbana upon landing. And that's interesting because what that means is there's a there's an interesting simile used for this. Like if you're if you have like hot iron and you're banging onto that hot iron and there's like flex of that iron coming and, and dropping onto the cold ground, upon landing it gets cooled. So in the same way there is some karma cool in the form of clinging to the Dhamma, which is what the anagami has to let go of, which causes the consciousness then to uh, descend into a, a new nama rupa at the pure abode, and upon landing, the being experiences arahatship, and then can experience parinibbana thereafter. So this is the second kind of anagami. The third kind of anagami is known as one who attains parinibbana without exertion. So the difference between the second and the third is one who, upon landing, attains arahatship and it enters parinibbana, is there's not enough fuel in the aggregates to continue. And so as soon as there is a fruition of arahatship, it dissolves and there's parinibbana. In the third case, uh, they, uh, they descend into the namarupa and they become arahats or they attain arahatship, but they have no exertion of it. There's just some fuel left in the form of the five aggregates. And then after some time, they will experience parinibbana. The fourth type is like the third type, but the difference is that upon landing, they are still an anagami, but they still they need some more exertion. They still need more meditation, more letting go, so that they attain arahatship, and at some future time, they will attain parinibbana. Mm -hmm. Then there's the fifth type, which is now... Why do we call it an anagami? That means they're a non-returner. They don't return back to any of the sensual spheres of existence. They continue on to go through the each of the pure abodes. And each of the five pure abodes are related to the different faculties that somebody develops. So if you develop the faculty of faith, or if you develop the faculty of energy, if you de develop the faculty of mindfulness, if you develop the faculty of collectedness, or if you develop the faculty of wisdom, dependent upon where your faculty is developed, that anagami will take rebirth in one of those five realms. So each of those faculties in ascending order correspond to each of those pure abodes. Mm. So the pure abodes are very interesting because that's the only place you will find uh, that anagamis will take rebirth in and they will then become arahats and then be off the wheel of samsara. So then beyond this, we have the formless realms, which are uh, basically corresponding to the formless jhanas, the arupa jhanas, the ayatanas. So you have the realm of infinite space. So in these realms, there's no form. There's only mind, meaning when you think about nama rupa, or you think about mentality materiality, there is no more materiality here. There is only mentality. So there is an experience of infinite space at infinite space. There is an experience of infinite consciousness at the realm of infinite consciousness. So the difference is in infinite space, there's an awareness of everything is just uh, an infinitude of space. There's no borders anywhere. And so it's, some people have experienced this when they go back into their past lives and uh, they'll say, I had this experience where like there was nothing to grab onto. There was like I was everything or I was I was space itself. That's the kind of experience that they'll have when they go back into this particular life. Or when you get into infinite consciousness, then you're starting to see uh, different kinds of awarenesses arise and pass away in the mentality itself. So different kinds of thoughts and ideas and concepts and things like that then in nothingness, all of that stops. And so it's basically the same as the Arupa Jhana of nothingness, where it's very equanimous. There's an experience of total peace and tranquility here, and there's nothing there. There's nothing to be or nothing to hold on to, but there is still a sense of being in the sense that I am nothing. That's the kind of thought process that arises in that sphere, that... I have come to the ultimate where I am nothing. Mm, so there's still subtle identification with yeah. being. 
And uh, you would end up in one of those by getting attached to the jhanas again? Attached to the level of nothingness. Yeah. Yeah. And then you have neither perception nor non-perception, which is very interesting because if you think about people who've experienced neither perception nor non-perception, there's not a whole lot that they can kind of experience in it in itself, but they look back and they see, you know, what is happening and they are able to kind of notice certain things and, and things like that. But in the realm of neither perception or non-perception, all there is is conceit, the basic conceit of I am. Mm. So they won't have any experience as such. They won't be able to recognize any kind of mental contact and things like that. It's just a sense of I am, like I exist, and that's it. And so when a being has, has uh, burned out the fuel of existence in here, there is an intention that arises that can create a new existence in a different realm, lower, lower than that realm. So these are really all of the, well, we've gone through sort of a, uh, a Cliff Notes version, if you will, of the 31 planes of existence. Thank you, Delson. That was, uh, that was great. I guess, you know, if people want to get more into this and really go even more in depth, is there a resource you might recommend? Yes. Uh, well, you can see them in the different suttas, but um, there is some information in some kinds of books, like the book called uh, the Co Buddhist Cosmology, which is written by Venerable uh, Puna Damo. And, uh, well, I'm going to plug it, but uh, my upcoming book, which I'm still working on, on dependent origination, uh, also gives some details of these different realms. Awesome. Well, I look forward to that.